Welcome to AgriFood Conversations, brought to you by iSelect, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is Luke Wozenschuk, an analyst on the iSelect team, and I'm excited to wa welcome you all to today's call. On today's AgriFood Conversations call, we are joined by Sharon Berberick, founder and CEO of Plastomics. Plastomics is developing the next generation of high-performing crops via chloroplast genetic engineering to significantly improve the way that biotechnology is used to deliver higher performing seeds to farmers. Plastomics' platform technology provides solutions for many current industry challenges, high efficient trait stacking, decreased time and cost to market, more efficient trait dose, simplified breeding, and elimination of outcrossing to weeds and neighboring fields. The result, higher yielding crops to meet the needs of the growing planet. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Plastomics Network. You are potential customers for Plastomics' products and services. You built and sold a company like Plastomics, or you are a sophisticated business person who understands Plastomics' market and the challenges they may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. A few process comments. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information about Plastomics' products and services to help them find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them better grow their business. You are all on mute. You can, ask, you can use the chat window to ask a question. After the formal part of the presentation, we will answer as many questions as time allows. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Sharon Berberick, founder and CEO of Plastomics. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, Luke and Susan, uh, to showcase Plastomics. Um, I'd, I'd like this to be interactive, so um, if people want to ask questions, um, that would be great. So Plastomics is um, a plant biotechnology company. And you know, Luke talked about um, chloroplast engineering. And you know, for people that aren't so familiar with biology, um, the chloroplast is nature's powerhouse. You know, it is the single probably most efficient conversion of sunlight to energy that nature has created. And that chloroplast actually has um, features and can be um, manipulated and used to design new crops that can be more efficient and can be more sustainable and help farmers feed the world. And that's what Plastomics is about. We're, we're harnessing the power of the chloroplast to help design new crops. And I want to introduce the team first, because this team is a team that can deliver on that vision. We have 150 years of experience in ag biotech on our team. Um, Jeff is the technical founder of the team, co-founded with um, our founder in Germany. Uh, Jeff and Ralph both went to school and worked on this technology at Rutgers University. Um, I, I met Jeff at Monsanto along with Dave and Elizabeth, who are also co-founders and uh, the, the management team. So we've all worked together in one capacity or another, which gives us great chemistry, and we know that we are going to succeed in achieving our vision. We also have a very trusted bank of advisors, um, including some technical advisors from Bear Crop and, and our board members. So the biggest challenge that we have going forward with a growing population is to make sure we can protect our food supply so that it can feed, and feed people and also along the way protect our planet and preserve the environment. And one of those challenges is the global warming. And with global warming comes lots of challenges. Not only has it increased carbon footprint, but it also has increased the insect population and scientists predict that as the globe warms, ravenous insects can eat up to 15 to 20% of our crop plants in a single season. 
So farmers need new and more sustainable technology to make sure that they can protect our crop plants as the, the climate changes and as the world's population grows. And biotech crops are actually one of the solutions that have met this challenge on an ongoing basis. In fact, biotech crops are the most widely adopted technology in agriculture ever. And they have been very sustainable and have helped to protect the environment by reducing pesticides, um, protecting plants from insects, and they've increased crop productivity to help feed smallholder farmers. And they've actually reduced the carbon footprint of agriculture equivalent to 12 million cars being taken off the road in one year. These are huge benefits of biotechnology crops. And we want to, at Plastomics, we want to ensure that this technology um, is able to keep up with the challenges in the industry. So let me give you an example of how biotech was able to keep up and deliver a solution, a sustainable solution. Back in the early 1900s, this European corn borer came in on some broom corn into the U.S. And it came in in a port up in New England. And, with, and very quickly, over a matter of you know, 20 years or so, the corn borer had spread across the entire corn belt and was causing billions of dollars worth of damage. You know, the farmers were trying to combat it with chemicals um, and, and other controls, but the insects liked to get inside the stalk of the corn plant, and it was very difficult to control. There was no sustainable way to control it. And here came biotech something called BT corn that had the pesticide incorporated inside the plant was developed and introduced that could control these insects without spraying chemical pesticides. But as more and more of these BT crops showed up in agriculture, not only corn, but also um, cotton, insects quickly became resistant to that plant incorporated pesticide called BT. So this is one of the challenges we face now. Insects are becoming resistant to these biotech crops. They're also, weeds are becoming resistant to the herbicide tolerance inside of these crops. And overcoming resistance is going to require that the industry stack multiple traits inside these crops to fend off the resistance. This is a big challenge for the industry right now. Because this market need for traits has increased, the technology that we're currently using cannot actually deliver the solution we need for the future. In fact, the technology that we're using to make our, our improved crops was developed in the 1990s. And it was developed for one thing, just like this cell phone. This Motorola cell phone was state of the art back at the same time when the technology was developed. It could do one thing. It could make a call. It could receive a call. And the technology that we developed back in those days was really only um, developed to put in one trait or maybe two traits into the plant. You know, fast forward 10 years, the growers loved this technology so much they wanted more traits stacked together. And the industry responded by actually crossbreeding multiple traits um, into a single crop, um, but not developing new technology to develop those crops. This, this multiple trait stacking was very expensive, and after a certain point, a number of traits, it, it's not feasible. So fast forward to 2020 and beyond, the industry is now developing crop plants that will have 15 to 20 traits in them, and we don't have a technology that can do that efficiently. We need an iPhone for our, our crop plants. We need something that can do multiple things at one time and develop a crop plant that can actually fend off all of these different abiotic stresses and challenges. So not only is trait stacking difficult with the current technology, there's a whole host of other limitations that the current technology has. It, it's very hard to breed um, without losing the yield um, capacity and potential of the commercial genetics for crops. Those timelines for breeding are very long. Um, when you 
the current technology also contains the traits in pollen and they can outcross to your neighbor's field. And then we also develop resistance more quickly, especially to insects, because with the current technology, you really can't get a high dose. So it's kind of like if you don't finish your bottle of antibiotics, you're more likely to develop a bug that's resistant because that bug didn't get a high enough dose to be eliminated. And then the process to get these crops to market is very inefficient and has a high cost associated with it. So let's talk about what the technology is. And this is the biology lesson. This is a picture of a cell. And in, in the cell, there's multiple components. But I want to highlight the two components, the nucleus and the chloroplast. Every living cell has a nucleus. That's where all the genetic information is stored for that organism. And this is the site where all the current products on the market have the traits inserted into the nucleus. But plants also had that powerhouse, that chloroplast, where the energy is created, where photosynthesis occurs. It also has its own genetic information. And we at Plastomics know how to take the traits and put them into the chloroplast and leverage that powerhouse of the chloroplast. So our way is better. The features, the biological features of the chloroplast and its natural cellular processes make the engineering much more precise. Um, it makes it very efficient and we can create effective traits because as you can see in this picture of this cell, there's lots of chloroplasts within each cell. Chloroplasts are also only passed on from generation to generation through the seed, not through the pollen, which actually facilitates a much faster breeding cycle, which is important to get these crops to market. And also, we have no trait drift through pollen. So we can, with this technology, we can deliver value across the food chain. We can de deliver value to the seed company. We can deliver benefits to the farmer and ultimately to the consumer. So this is a new tool that can actually create more sustainable products across the value chain. But at Plastomics, the way we're going to get these products to market is through the seed companies. And the value proposition to them is what we're really focused on. The simple breeding is important because you can get products to market about two years faster. And the graphic to, to the right of this slide kind of shows the life cycle of commercial genetics in the marketplace. And in order to get a biotech crop to market, scientists develop that product in what we call a prototype product, which is not in the same genetic background that the farmers will buy in commercial seed. You have to transfer that trait from the non-commercial genetics into four or 500 of commercial inbred, for instance, for corn, that can then be used to create the commercial products. That's a long drawn out process and typically takes about five generations of corn, for instance, to get to market. With plastomics, we can do it in one generation, which shaves off about two years for getting commercial products to the market. And I'll explain in the next slide how we can eliminate this, this yield drag that happens with um, breeding traits that are in the nucleus. And then we, as, as I said, we can also make more effective traits. Um, New traits are possible, like photosynthetic traits that can, high, um, ex that can increase the yield. And we can also extend the product life cycle by bringing in new traits on the chloroplast and combining them with traits that are already out in the marketplace in the nucleus. And then because of no outcrossing, we can actually open up some new biotech markets, which I'll expand on. And it's also a better stewardship profile because we don't have to worry about those traits you know, moving around in the environment and being someplace where the grower or the neighbor doesn't want to see those traits. So this is a very sciencey slide, and don't worry if you don't get it. But this is this is actually how traits get integrated into commercial germplasm. 
So the lab donor in blue contains your trait, which is the red spot. And this represents the 10 chromosomes of corn. So you have to cross that to your commercial inbred, which is the yellow um, chromosomes, which jumbles up both of those genetics into um, a combination of yellow and blue. And you still see your red spot. And each generation that you back cross this, you try to select for more and more of the yellow and less and less of the blue. And people use what's called molecular markers to do that. But you can never get it 100% pure. You can see in the last um, cartoon there that you have little bits of blue stuck around your trait and just randomly in your chromosomes. And this is what caused causes the, di the diminishing yield in genetics that have been developed for commercial products. This is to the tune about 3 to 5%. So the yield potential of commercial corn lines can be diminished by 3 to 5% because of this, what is called yield drag or yield lag. We don't get any of that with chloroplasts because we're not putting our trait into the nucleus. It's in the chloroplast, and it doesn't disturb any of the commercial genetics. So we talked about more effective traits, and this is an example of a proof of concept that we've done at Plastomics. There's a new insect control technology called RNAi. It's a new mode of action. Um, just like any other insecticide, there's modes of action on how it acts to kill the insect. RNAi is a new mode of action that um, is being developed by scientists in the industry. And the concentration of it is very difficult to achieve a high enough concentration to kill insects um, in the nucleus, particularly for lepidopteran insects, which you know are the caterpillars that turn into moths and they're all over our windshield when we drive through Illinois um, in the summertime. They require a very high dose. Well, we've shown with chloroplast engineering, we can put the trait into the chloroplast, and we can get a high enough concentration to kill off these lepidopteran insects. This is a really great um, result and has actually um, caught the attention of a lot of the big seed company players. Then finally, um, just an example of new biotech market opportunities. You know, the reason that some crops don't have some of these agronomic traits, biotech traits in them, is because the regulatory agencies have prohibited those from being engineered into those crops that outcross with either native species like sunflower or with weedy species like sorghum. So if a weed is going to get a trait from a biotech crop that gives it a competitive advantage, then the regulators aren't going to approve that. With chloroplast, there's no trait in the pollen, so it will not cross-pollinate with those weeds or native species. And this is going to open up markets for crops like rice that outcross the weeds and sorghum. And it eases the stewardship concerns of the regu regulators. In fact, at Plastomics, we have been working a bit on sorghum, and we've also talked to the U.S. regulators, and they um, agreed that they would be able to approve a, for instance, a herbicide tolerant sorghum product that had the trait put into the chloroplast. So this is a platform technology, which means that we can do multiple things with this platform. Not only can we do multiple crops, but there's opportunities for multiple traits. You know, the chloroplast is a metabolic machine inside of the plant cell, and we can increase nutrients we can increase protein, we can have more effective insect and weed control, we can increase enzymes that help with biofuel production, and then we can also engineer photosynthesis that could ultimately help um, facilitate higher yielding crops. But right now, we are focused on corn. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the science and why plastomics is unique and what we're doing. We initially have been focused on corn. And the reason being is that um, corn has not been 
amenable to chloroplast engineering. Scientists have tried this um, in several times in the past in the past and have not been successful. And the problem is, is that the way that, that people develop biotech crops and corn is you start with this tissue um, that is in the A panel that is a white blob. Chloroplasts are green, there's no chloroplasts in there. So the current methodology, we really have to remake the current methodology to fashion it for chloroplasts. So that's what plastomics is doing. We are innovating around changing this methodology, which you see is used for nuclear engineering, to make it amenable to chloroplast engineering. And the way that they're, we're doing this is the following. So every engineering platform, so you hear a lot about gene editing. Gene editing uses the same platforms as biotechnology does. You have to have a, a piece of DNA that contains your trait. That's easy, we do that routinely here um, at, at Plastomics. You have to have the right target tissue. And, and you saw in the slide before this that the current target tissue that's used for corn is really not the right target tissue. So we've been developing new um, plant tissues that are amenable to this process. Um, you also have to have a way to deliver. We deliver with direct DNA delivery. We don't use agrobacterium. Um, which actually gives us a regulatory advantage as well through USDA. Um, and then we have to develop a way to select for the cells that contain our trait, um, that we know contain the trait, and that we can regenerate into a corn plant. So those two red circle areas are the places where plastomics is innovating and where we're filing patents. And we're well on our way. We've actually developed um, three new target tissues, and we're working on probably about 10 different selection schemes. And uh, we're getting very close to, to finalizing the process that's going to work. So I have to give credit to our technical team. Um, actually, you'll see here the word soybean on this page as well. We've actually have initiated and are doing experimentation with soybean to get the soybean platform up and running. Um, we're hoping that in the future we'll be able to do rice. Um, anyway, I just have to give kudos to the people that work in the lab because they're the ones that really deliver the results for the company. So let's go to the business side a little bit. Well, you know, how are we going to get this to market and how are we going to make money at, at Plastomics? Well, we have a B2B licensing model. Um, we have professed that we are not going to become a seed company. We will partner with entities to do research and co-develop products. We will license those products, um, you know, and get licensing fees and milestone payments. And then long term, Plastomics will realize royalties on the sale of those seeds um, in the marketplace. We hope, because of that royalty stream, that we will create enough value in the company that we will probably be acquired. And that is our exit strategy, is acquisition. So just a little bit on how to go to market. There's, there's really two main ways that we're going to develop products. We will um, partner with trait discovery entities and with seed companies. So a trait discovery entity is a company like EvaGene, you may have heard, that have these bioinformatic platforms. They look inside organisms and plants and microbes to mine um, traits that could be useful for the industry, like antifungals, insect control. And they have those platforms. We don't have a trait discovery platform. Seed companies obviously have the commercial seeds, but they also have trait discovery platforms. So if we partner with a trait discovery entity that can't make a product, we would actually combine our platform with their trait, make this prototype product, and we could license that to anyone in the industry that's interested. With the bigger seed companies, if they bring us a trait, we would develop that prototype product and we would give it back to that seed company partner who then would commercialize it. So this is the way that we'll go to market. 
Um, we will not take a product all the way to the market ourselves. And this is actually a very lucrative market. So the potential for royalties is great. The global biotech seed market is roughly about $20 billion in sales. And about $10 billion of that are these stacked traits and crops. So this is a real opportunity. And we just need the right partners that can get us into those markets. So this is just an example of the value that you can generate um, just with a royalty stream. Um, with a bag of corn seed and one insect control trait just in the U.S. alone at $6 per bag on a discounted cash flow model of the royalty stream, the NPV, and this is a 10-year, I believe, NPV, is $170 million. So that's the kind of magnitude of revenue that you can generate on royalties from uh, this product. And this is, this is a proven revenue model in the industry. And because we have a platform technology, you know, we have the opportunity to create lots of products and develop multiple exit partners. So how are we going to get there? So our company was founded in 2017. Uh, we didn't get our first investment until it'll actually be um, a our two-year anniversary next week on August 28th, we got our first dollars in the door. And with that money in 2017, we set up our laboratory and we set up our model platform where we can test traits before we put them into the crop species. We entered into uh, three different proof of concept projects and had success with those, one of which you've seen with those insect traits. And um, all along in 2017 and 2018, we were also developing the corn um, platform. So in 2019, the key milestones we need to meet is to demonstrate that we have developed the technology to repeatedly uh, engineer corn and soybean in the chloroplast. Um, we are currently entering into negotiations with some of the trait providers that we know and we will begin to make proof of concept products in 2020 as well as raise our series a in 2020 and then once we have those proof of concept products um, that will lead to the licensing and then you know an exit in 2022 is probably a bit aggressive but um, eventually we will get to an exit so our total seed round is 2.25 million dollars um, and we are currently almost fully subscribed to that. So what do we have to do um, in the next few months, um, the next year, is close the seed round. And actually, we only have about $165,000 left in this round. We have to demonstrate that success in corn or soybean or both, engage a strategic partner. And um, I did neglect to say that we are in um, probably late stage discussions with one of the major seed companies um, to develop a collaboration. And then we just have to get that Series A raise. And we're also in discussion with a syndicate of investors um, to bring in that Series A round. So I do want to give a shout out and kudos to our, our current investors. Um, we have a local, actually, St. Louis private family office that is our, our major investor, Biogenerator, here in St. Louis. I Select, of course, has, is one of our, our main investors. And then other local investors in St. Louis, Yield Lab, Tech Excel, St. Louis Economic Development Partnership, the Missouri Technology Corporation, and, of course, the St. Louis Archangels. And with that, I'd like to say thank you, and we can open up um, the floor for any questions. Awesome. Thanks for walking us through that, Sharon. Really, really interesting stuff that you guys are working on over at Platstomics. Uh, so to the audience, to ask a question, you can use the hand raising icon and I will unmute you so you can go ahead and ask your question in person. Or you can use the question window on the right side of your screen and type it into the question box. Uh, so I can get things started here, Sharon, and ask a few of my own questions. Um, you are currently looking to apply the chloroplast transform technology to multiple different crops. Seems like you're more or less focused on corn in the short term, but 
Is there any sort of sense that you have that maybe this approach is, is better suited for some sorts of crops than others? What would you say is the biggest limitations of the technology um, as you see it? So this is definitely suited for multiple crops. And in the past, um, the crops that have been most amenable to this technology are uh, tobacco, potato, tomato, um, solanacea crops. We're not focused on those because most of those are, are not biotech crops. Um, you know, so we're also working on sorghum and soybean. Sorghum um, is probably equally uh, challenging as corn is. Soybean has been demonstrated, uh, this technology has been demonstrated in the past by bear crop science that it was very inefficient and they never took any of these products to market. So we're developing the soybean based on a much more efficient process. So the biggest challenge are the monocot crops, sorghum, rice, and corn. And I, I think we have overcome most of the challenges and now it's a, probably just a matter of time until we sort out the actual process um, to deliver the technology in those crops. Gotcha. Very interesting. Um, my next question is about other sorts of crop innovation technologies. So obviously this, this approach has significant advantages over traditional biotech crossbreeding, um, but how does the, the chloroplast transform technology compare to the advances that we're seeing in technologies like CRISPR? Um, where is it better? Where is it lacking? Um, both in terms of its capabilities and also the development process timeline. So, <clears throat> in, to compare it to other technologies, so I, I really look at it and there's a couple of buckets of technology. You know, one is the routine nuclear engineering technology, which um, I've already demonstrated there's some clear advantages here for the chloroplast technology. The second bucket is using gene editing tools to put traits in a site-specific location in the nucleus. The current nuclear technology is random. So it's gonna go randomly in a place in one of those 10 chromosomes in corn. You can control where it goes using gene editing tools that break open the double helix, you stuff the trait in, it repairs. That process is still not completely fleshed out. It's, and it's very inefficient. Okay, so that's gonna take much longer than the, the chloroplast transformation. We don't need a gene editing tool to put our trait package precisely where we want it in the chloroplast. We use a natural process that takes up the trait package specifically in a location just using homologous gene sequences. Now, gene editing is a completely different platform. If you're gonna gene edit the um, genetics of a plant without introducing any traits um, that are heterologous to that plant, it's difficult to make certain traits with that technology because the plant has to have an inherent trait already inside of it that you can either modify, upregulate, or downregulate. And so it's going to be really difficult to, to do some traits like insect resistance. Um, it may be hard to actually manipulate photosynthesis. It may be hard, harder to upregulate um, certain pathways. So the chloroplast engineering has, you know, these features that actually give it a competitive advantage over all of those other platforms. And I do have a slide on that, I just don't have it in this deck. <laughs> gotcha, can... well thank you for walking us through that, Sharon. Um, and then also, will this, will this be labeled as a genetically modified crop? And if so, what sort of additional regulatory challenges do you anticipate? Um, and, and also, how are you planning to go about the um, the, the marketing debacle that, that faces all sorts of uh, genetically modified organisms at this point. 
Well, the first of all, the technology will be labeled as genetically modified. Um, and, you know, I think just like every other biotechnology company today that's de developing biotechnology crops, I think the, the regulatory path, first of all, will not be any different for this technology versus regular nuclear engineering technology. Might be a little bit different for gene edited, but you know, people think gene editing products don't have any regulation, but that's um, not true. So I think we can, you know, build a story and, and demonstrate the advantages of this technology from a stewardship perspective with no pollen outcrossing. And, and we can actually deliver benefit to the consumer because we can, you know, engineer a plant that's going to be much more efficient um, with its technology. So, you know, we're, we're pretty far away from the regulatory path, but I know that every company right now is thinking about the next genetically modified crop has to be sustainable for the environment and it has to have a benefit. So we have a lot of benefits already with our technology that we, that we can demonstrate. Yes, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, so really, really interesting stuff, Sharon. If I'm a potential uh, partner, whether that be investor or a seed developer listening to this and interested in getting involved with the plastomics journey, what should they know about your company's stage and, and how they can get in touch with you? So we are, um, you know, seed stage, and we are actively looking for partners um, to develop traits, to use our technology maybe in a way that we haven't thought about, um, to work on different crops. Um, we're, and, and we're also, we also will be, uh, you know, raising our Series A round, so there's opportunities to participate in that. Um, and I would say that's probably about it. You know, we're, we're, um, we're on our journey and we're at the beginning. <laughs> so, you know, people can contact me if they want to learn more about this technology and about how there's potential for collaboration. You know, one thing I did not mention is um, the chloroplast technology is being used by several entities to make vaccines and drugs in plants. And that's something we've thought about, but um, we would have to have a partner to do that. So that would be a, of interest to us as well. Wow, yeah, that, that would be really interesting. Um, well, thanks for your time today, Sharon. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone else, for taking the time to listen, on, listen in on the webinar. If you'd like to learn more about plastomics, please let us know by answering this poll question. We host these calls every week at 3 p.m. Central. You can register for AgriFood Conversations uh, webinar series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. A replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. And if you know of others that might want to see this webinar again in replay, they will be able to access it online at agrifoodconversations.com within 24 hours. Thank you, everyone, for paying attention, and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thanks, Luke.